This lecture will focus on community interactions. Communities are the relationships between different species in the same ecosystem. What we know about living things in an ecosystem is they cannot exist by themselves. I always like to think of it like this. We all can agree that oranges are healthy to eat, but would you agree with me if I said a diet of only oranges is healthy to eat? I'm hoping you would say no, because you wouldn't get a diversity of nutrients. And in thinking about what an orange is, an orange comes from an orange tree, which is another organism. And you need a variety of organisms in your diet to give you all of the different nutrients that you need. In addition, you need other organisms like E. coli in your digestive system that helps you to digest your food. So there's just a few different ways that we as organisms rely on other organisms in our own ecosystems, but that's true for every organism in an ecosystem. The other thing about life in an ecosystem is there's a very delicate balance between the biotic factors, living factors, and abiotic, non-living factors. And if you remember back from population ecology, biotic potential and environmental resistance, they work against each other and they tend to have a way of balancing out the number of living things as well as the resources that living things depend on in an ecosystem. And so there's a little bit of regulation there by that interaction between biotic potential and environmental resistance. Now, in an ecosystem, when you have certain either biotic factors or abiotic factors that are introduced to an ecosystem that typically aren't there, you can have widespread disruption. One way that humans disrupt ecosystems is by introducing invasive species. And what that means is that humans bring a species from another area of the world to an ecosystem that has never had that organism in the ecosystem. So for example here, the lionfish. The lionfish is found on the other side of the world in the Indo-Pacific. In the Caribbean area, just south of Florida, this species has now become a very big problem. Somehow, and there's a lot of hypotheses as to how this fish got there, but somehow this fish was introduced into the Caribbean where it has never lived before and it has very good biotic potential with very little environmental resistance because it doesn't have many predators and so everybody's just going about their regular community interactions without really noticing that this lionfish is there. And what a lionfish does is they have an a very large mouth for the size of their body, and it has excellent suction power. And so they can end up suctioning lots and lots of babies and juvenile fish from the community. Now, in doing so, if, if you remember back to the graphs on the different stages of life, what we saw was as we had young folks who the um, got older, and then those folks got older, that you would have either a pyramid or you would have a little tiny bit of a pyramid, not very wide, or you would have it smaller with the juveniles. And so if you had a smaller amount of juveniles in an ecosystem in those age structure graphs, you would find that the population would shrink over time. And what the lionfish is doing here is it's actually making the ecosystem shrink over time. And that's typically what an invasive species does. So another example of an invasive species that we find in our area is purple loosestrife. Purple loosestrife is typically found in Europe. And back in the 1800s, people thought of the wetlands, and when we're talking about wetlands, they're typically full of green plants, and then um, sometimes they have cattails, which have a little bit of that brown to them. 
that people thought, well, these are kind of boring colors. So let's introduce something that's more lively, like this purple flowered plant. And so what happened was, is that there were no natural predators to eat the purple loosestrife. And it started to just take over all of the wetlands. Now, if you drive around in our area, you might notice that at the beginning of the summer, throughout the summer as well, that you'll see these beautiful blooms in wetland areas. And that's purple loosestrife. So why do invasive species grow so well in a community? As I mentioned before with the lionfish, they don't have any natural predators, and so therefore they can show great biotic potential and increase exponentially, which means that they can spread pretty uncontrollably. They often displace or kill off a large diversity of species. Sometimes they bring allergens, which can be harmful to human health, and in other cases, by lowering the biodiversity, one of the worries with the lionfish is that they're going to eat up, eat up all of the beautiful coral reef fish, and it's going to leave the coral reefs with just lionfish, and it won't be as beautiful. So in that, it can have an effect on the economy of different countries in the Caribbean because people won't want to come and see the beautiful coral reefs anymore. So again, a community is all of the living things in one area or in a specific ecosystem. It also includes all of their different interactions that they have. Community interactions, one of the things about it, and you can see here in the picture, that they will limit and shape each other, each other's populations through time. And we talked a little bit about that when we looked at population ecology, and we talked about the predator-prey relationship, that when the prey started to show that biotic potential, that there would be a little bit of a lag where the predators would then sh start to show biotic potential. But then once you had a lot of predators, you would start to get that crash and of the prey, and soon after, because the prey has crashed, the food for the predators is gone down, so now the predators will crash. So what happens in community interactions is a concept called coevolution. And by definition, coevolution means when two interacting species act as agents of natural selection on each other. Okay, well, what does that mean? It means that as one species changes or evolves, then the other one has to adjust, change, or evolve. And we see coevolution in a wide variety of community relationships. So for example, that if we're looking at this flower here, and let's say that the flower was much shorter in size, and it has over time some mutation that causes the flower to be much longer in size, and in becoming longer, perhaps the nectar from within can get eaten as well, and it protects that plant. And so simultaneously, what might happen in the hummingbird population is that a hummingbird who has a mutation for a longer nose is better at getting that nectar from now these plants here the flowers that have the nectar way at the base here. And so become because a hummingbird with the characteristic for long nose can survive better, then they have more time to reproduce and pass on that gene for the good characteristic to their offspring. And so we have this back and forth. The slipper lobster has sacrificed speed for the protection of camouflage. Not exactly lightning fast himself, the loggerhead relies on persistence and his powerful jaws. happened over evolutionary time is that sea turtles had a soft mouth 
and slipper lobsters had a soft body. Now, let's say that the slipper lobster, there is one that has a mutation for hard body. And this is a benefit because the soft mouth sea turtle predator can't bite through the hard body. So the hard bodied slipper lobster is favored in that environment. Nature selects for that particular characteristic at that time given the predator that the slipper lobster has. Now, all the ladies in the population are like, ooh, I like that guy with the hard body because he doesn't get eaten as easily. So he is going to have that characteristic that if we mate, he can pass on to my babies and my babies will also have that protection too. So over time, the males with the hard bodies or the females with the hard bodies will be selected for. And then simultaneously, perhaps what happens in the sea turtle population is that there's a mutation for a hard mouth. And so let's say that there is a female and she has a hard mouth. Her mates will be thinking, ooh, I like her with the hard mouth because she can bite through the slipper lobsters. And if I mate with her, she'll get more food and so will my babies. And so over time, the hard mouth sea turtle gets selected for. Now, in the slipper lobster population, because they need a better way to get away from their hard mouth predators now, perhaps there's a mutation for really strong abdominal muscles. And so what might happen in the slipper population, slipper lobster population, is that there's a mutation where there are some born with the strong abs and in having strong abs, they can do a quick crunch and they can swim quickly away from the sea turtle. Now, perhaps as that evolutionary pressure is gone back and forth in this co-evolutionary relationship, perhaps maybe speed in the sea turtle population will be the next characteristic that is selected for. And like I said, we see a lot of different ways that, predator, that animals have that co co-evolution with each other. So certainly predators and prey. That lions, um, maybe they were darker in color and these gazelles were not as fast and perhaps there was a mutation to the lions that made the lighter color ones more easily able to blend in with the grasses so they could do kind of like a sit and wait type of predation or sit and wait to attack their prey. And when a gazelle came jumping by, they could jump out and surprise the gazelle and eat it. Now the gazelles in their population, the characteristic of being fast would be more selected for because they would be able to run away from a lion's attack. And so there's that kind of back and forth. And this can even happen between an animal and its food, even if that food is a plant. And so horses were able to eat grass and over time, what is selected for in the grass is to have more fiber in it. And with having more fiber, it's much harder for the horses to rip off and eat. And then um, the what's selected for later in the horse is that the horse who has a mutation to have flatter teeth, the flatter tooth horse is able to rip better through the grass with the fiber or the cellulose. And so we kind of have that back and forth. And another thing that we see with some plants is that some plants have even evolved the ability to have poison inside of their bodies um, to mess with their predators. So in community interactions, we're gonna look at four different categories. We're gonna talk about competition, predation, parasitism, and mutualism. So let's start with competition. There's two types of competition. There's interspecific competition and there's intraspecific competition. Interspecific competition is competition between members of different species and intraspecific competition is competition between members of different species. Now, when we talk about having competitions, 
Oftentimes in humans, we call them winners and losers. And so we know that the loser is generally harmed by the competition. But is it easy in general for a winner to win a competition? Not really. And so generally when there is competition, both participants get harmed. And the other thing that happens is that there's a reduction in each other's access to some limited resources. Now, this really depends on how similar the ecological niche is between the two competitors. So what is the ecological niche? The ecological niche is every aspect of a organism's life. And the niche includes the habitat or the physical home, its resources, resource needs, like what kind of energy does it need, what materials does it need to build its home or protect its young, what environmental needs does it have, what temperature does it best live at, what level of humidity, how much water does it need, its behaviors, how it interacts with others of the same species, with predators, with prey, with competitors, and then the last part of the ecological niche is the job or the role of the organism. Now, no two ecological niches are the same. And so what can happen in an ecological niche is that if they are very similar or even the same species, is that the more adapted or the better adapted one will outcompete the other one and the other one will exist at a lower carrying capacity or it might die off completely. There was a classic study done between paramecium, two different species of paramecium, um, but different genus. Uh, they were put in separate flasks and when each was put in separate flasks and they had all the resources that they need, they showed that S shape curve. And so you can see that they showed some exponential growth, that J shape curve here, but then environmental resistance begins to kick in and they start to level off at their carrying capacity. And remember that carrying capacity means the maximum amount in a population that can be supported for a really long time. So now when they took the two and they dumped them into one flask, what they found was the better adjusted of the two species showed that biotic potential, that J-shaped curve that went into an S to show leveling off of the carrying capacity. Now this one does really well as a competitor to the red, which the red one shows that J-shaped curve and doesn't do very well when it hits environmental resistance. And so we see that it goes down, down, down until it actually dies off in population. So one of the things about evolution is that evolution favors organisms who have less competitors. Kind of makes sense, right? If you don't have as much com competition, then you do better. It'd be like me saying that, oh, I forgot to tell you all that I only give out one A and the rest of the students get an F. You all would heavily compete with each other for that one A. You would probably start to sabotage each other and you would do things that might harm your conscience or your soul and you would probably do things that you didn't feel real good about. So that competition would definitely harm you. But if you are in an ecosystem and you could begin to be a little bit more specialized in that ecosystem, you won't have to compete as much. And so I've got a couple of examples. So here in the ecosystem, there are these yellow birds and the yellow birds, they're used to eating bugs all over this tree. And then coming into the ecosystem are a little bit bigger red birds and the red birds also like those bugs. Now, do you think it would be smart for the yellow birds who are smaller than the red birds to fight with the red birds for all of the bugs on the tree? Or do you think that it would be better if the yellow birds all stayed up here at the top of the tree and down in the grass and left the trunk of the tree for the red birds? And so what we call this is we call this resource partitioning or sharing, that each has specialized in a different part of their niche to reduce the amount of competition that they have. We also can see this in different kinds of warbler birds. Warblers, 
will do those very long migrations from very far up in North America and all the way down to South America. And so what we find with the warblers is they move from ecosystem to ecosystem that they, instead of, let's say that this bird here was the first to arrive at this tree, and then all four of these other birds come, would it be smart for this bird to fight off all four to have control of the entire tree? Or would it be smarter for this bird to say, hey, you know what, if I kind of occupy this area, you can have that area, you can have that area, you can have that area, and you can have that area, and we all can share the resources of the tree without fighting, and that way none of us will be harmed. That sounds a lot better to me. So organisms, they utilize, again, resource partitioning, occupying a more specialized or smaller portion of their niche than they would if they were alone. And what that does is it reduces the harmful effects of competition. Pretty smart. So intra-specific competition, if you remember me mentioning this, this is competition between members of one species. Now this can be pretty rough because when we're talking about competition between members of one species, their niche is really similar, if not the same. And so even within a population, each organism will try to specialize in different parts of their niche and share different parts of their niche to reduce competition between members of the same species. And again, interspecific competition is competition between members of different species. So here, interspecific competition, we have a tree and we have all kinds of birds that are sharing this one tree or this one area of the ecosystem. You've got all of these different kinds of organisms doing the sharing so that they don't put as much evolutionary pressure on one another. So let's talk about our second point of community interactions, which is predation. Predation, by definition, is the act of killing and eating another organism. And so this can apply to, like, the classic great white shark is a big predator. But it also can apply to the horse eating grass. The horse is a predator of the grass. Um, it can apply to anything that eats something else. And so let's take a look at this. At sea, as on land, the sun shapes life. Sunlight and nutrients form the key links in nearly every food chain in the ocean. Okay, that, sorry, that cut off. I'll have some more videos for you as well. Uh, predation and evolution. Remember that this is a part of co-evolution, like you saw with the sea turtle and the slipper lobster, what we would have seen uh, with a whale attar attacking those seals, that you have them putting that evolutionary pressure back and forth on one another. So with a hawk and a mouse, we have seen coevolution over time because hawks, let's say they didn't have very good eyesight, they would just kind of fly around and they would look for movement and they'd look for their prey, the mouse. So what happens with the mice is that over time, the mice who have coloration that blends in better with their habitat, they're able to just hide in the grass. And those that have maybe a brighter color, they're they will stick out and so the hawk can see them. And once you have a lot of them who have evolved over natural selection to have a lighter color and blend in, the hawk, what happens in that population is that hawks that are born with better eyesight and can see the mice who are blended in, 
will be able to get more food and they will be selected for. Now, if you take a look at the mouse again, you'll see that the mouse has big eyes. So if we have a mutation in the mouse population where bigger eyes will allow for being able to be more active at night because you can see better in moonlight, then those mice with the bigger eyes can be active at night rather than when the hawks are active during the day. And so the next kind of force of coevolution on the hawks would be any hawks that would be able to see better at night or have some way to exist better in the nighttime. So what do animals evolve? They evolve anti-predator defenses or what we call counteracting behaviors. Counteracting behaviors are any behavior that either a predator or a prey exerts on one another, and it could be some kind of pressure from how they physically look. It could be how they physiologically act inside of their body, like poison, for example, or it could be a general behavior that they do to counteract their predator or their prey. So bats and moths. In bats, bats use sonar or echolocation to find moths in the dark of night. If you've heard that term blind as a bat, well, it can be true. There are some species that, of bats that are completely blind, but in general, bats use this sonar at night to quote unquote see rather than actually using their eyes. So their eyesight isn't very needed to be well developed. So what happens is, is that this sonar moths have developed very simple ears so that they can hear the bats flying as well as their sonar. And what happens then is that the bats, they change their sonar to a different frequency that they, the moths can't hear. And then over time, what happens is the moths, they start to produce a click that interferes with that sonar and so then the bats can't locate the moths. And so we go that back and forth, back and forth. The frog's mating songs also court danger. A fringe-lipped bat emerges from his shelter. The frogs are playing his favorite tune. Some frogs are poisonous, but the fringe-lipped bat comes hardwired to distinguish the call of dinner from the clamor of death. He can identify and avoid poisonous frogs just by listening to their calls. He pauses and then goes for the kill. Let's talk another part of being a good predator prey. One of the kinds of counteracting behaviors that an animal might use is camouflage. And camouflage is coloration or shape that basically makes that organism or animal inconspicuous in its environment. So it's right in front of you, but you can't see it. Either predators or prey might use camouflage to hide. Like I mentioned before with the lion, the lion uses camouflage to blend in with the grasses so that it can do a sneak attack on the gazelle. Here you have a flat fish. It's pretty hard to make out that the flat fish the body, I'm kind of tracing, this is the face here. There's two eyes and this is the other part of the body. So you have the tail right here and they blend in really well to their environment so that they can hide out from predators but also do that sneak attack on prey. Here you have a frog that blends its coloration in with the mud and the leaves that it lives in. 
and then the arctic fox. The majority of the year the arctic fox is white to blend in with the snow so it can just kind of like hunch down into the snow and blend in but when there is a short growing season it sheds this white coat and it develops a coat where it can hide amongst the branches and the foliage of plants. <laughs> Here, everything demands a closer look. On the surface of this sea fan are two polyps that are not polyps. They're pygmy seahorses, the world's smallest. Barely half an inch long. They're males, settling a territorial dispute by headbutting. And here's another example of a flatfish. Um, this wasn't a very interesting study because they took a flatfish and they put it in different environments that could blend into. And when they put it on a checkerboard, the flatfish actually kind of figured out the pattern of the checkerboard. And while it's not perfect, it's pretty good because that flash, flatfish had never seen that checkerboard before. A lot of times snakes, the coloration of snakes is used to camouflage. And so they end up having a lot of their body parts broken up by striping. And then that also matches the forest floor and the dirt. And then here, cheetahs, the reason why cheetahs are colored the way they are so they can blend in with the grasses just like what I said with the lion. Um, whenever you see an animal with spots or stripes like a zebra those make it hard to see when they're moving you can't really see the body outline and so spots and stripes also help to make it hard to see an individual or like zebras when they're in a whole pack it's hard to figure out where one zebra begins and the next one um, is. This is a frogfish. A frogfish, you can see the mouth right here, and here's one of the eyes. And it does not actually have holes, but it has spots on it so that it can look like a sponge that has holes in it. And what the frogfish does is it sits very, very still, and it uses a fishing pole off of its forehead and it can bring that fishing pole down and then he could put that fishing pole out and it wiggles this lure at the end of their fishing pole and when it does that other fish come and investigate that and then they <laughs> jump out and they attack and eat their prey. The birds themselves nourish another species. Spectacled caiman wait for a meal to fall out of the sky. So you can see alligators, crocodiles, caimans, they can all blend in really well with murky water and then they can jump out and attack. So let's answer this question. Which behavioral response to the threat of predation is most likely to be selected for in a species that uses camouflage for protection from predators? Is it A, a quick escape response, B, sudden display to startle the predator, C, cooperative behavior, D, behavior that mimics the behavior of the predator, or E, motionless behavior. 
Those all seem pretty good, but what answers the question best? If you said motionless behavior, you would be correct. Other counting Counteracting behaviors revolve around the coloration of an organism. And so when an organism has a bright coloration, it serves as a warning that says, I'm not gonna taste good or I'm pretty poisonous. And so that will be a warning sign for other predators to stay away from them. Sometimes there are species that will mimic a poisonous animal or mimic something else so that it has protection in its environment. So we have two examples here is this in the middle is actually a cactus and the cactus has evolved colorations to blend in with rocks and also have these points that look like little rocks like a pile of rocks there. These are Florida tree hoppers and they have evolved to be the same color and shape as thorns on a plant. And so here, you can't tell which of these is an actual thorn and which is a tree hopper insect. I wouldn't try and take a bite of any of those, that would hurt. Warning mimicry is when you have an animal that mimics another animal that is distasteful or poisonous. And so here we have the coral snake, as you saw before, and then here's the mountain king snake. And you might say, well, I can see there's a difference between them. But if you were out hiking and you saw a snake that had black, red, and yellow on it, and it was striped, would you take a minute to go, wait, let me think. The coral snake is the one that's poisonous. No, you would run away as fast as you can. And here is a local example. Monarch butterflies, which eat milkweed, they have a mimic, the viceroy, and monarch butterflies are poisonous because as caterpillars, you can see the caterpillar over here, it's white, black, and yellow, that the caterpillars eat the milkweed and milkweed is actually poisonous. And instead of dying from the poison, they incorporate that poison into their body and their body becomes poisonous as butterflies. Pretty clever. You can see the difference between the monarch and the viceroy because the monarch, it does not have these lines at the bottom of the wing. You can see the viceroy has these. And then also the viceroy, the second set of dots on the outer edge of the wing go right up to the edge where on the monarch, they're not right at the edge. Pretty hard to tell if something's flapping around. Is it the monarch or is it the viceroy? And then there are, some, there are some very aggressive mimics. So aggressive mimicry, one example would be the frogfish and a relative of the frogfish would be the anglerfish. If you saw the movie Finding Nemo, the anglerfish was in there. Anglerfish can make their lure phosphoresce or light up and they can not have their body light up. And then when something comes to investigate their lure, they can light up and they can <laughs> grab them. There's other forms of advanced mimicry that revolve not around necessarily coloration or physiology, but around behavior. And so here what we have is we have the jumping spider here on your left and the snowberry fly here on your right. Now you might think, um, I can tell the difference between those two, but pretty brilliant that the Snowberry fly, when it turns its backside toward you and it opens up its wings, the pattern on the wings kind of look like spider legs, right? So see that same pattern of the legs? And what it does is the a jumping spider, when they're getting ready to attack, they do a really funny dance. If you're interested, look it up on YouTube. And so the jumping spider gets down and it does its funky dance. And the snowberry fly sticks out its wings and it does the same dance. And so um, predators will be scared away. More counteracting behaviors, they're called startle coloration. And what startle, startle coloration is, it usually involves false eyes or eye spots. And what that means is that there are spots on a part of the body that are not as valuable 
as where the actual eyes are on the head. Because think about it, your eyes are right near your brain. And so if this moth were going to get attacked here or here, it would be better to get a bite here where a larger predator might look down and say, oh, that's the head because there's two eyes right here. And so if they go to bite the wing, they can bite the wing and then this moth can fly away. Same thing here with the swallowtail butterfly larva is these eye spots are on the tail. And so getting a little nip of your tail, certainly not as bad as getting your head bit off. They also can serve as warning to other species because if this moth is just hanging out looking for food and something flies over, bird flies over, it might see these two eyes or eye spots and think, whoa, that's a big animal down there. I don't want to mess with that because big eyes mean it's got to have a big body and I don't want to mess with something with a big body. Other animals use chemical warfare as counteracting behaviors. And so snakes use venom. When they bite, they can inject poison into whatever they're biting. And this is a bombardier beetle. This one is fascinating. This can actually release a chemical that can burn anybody that makes it mad. Also, maybe you've heard about skunks, how skunks can spray an oil that smells really, really bad. And octopuses and their relatives can, when they get mad, like this diver right here has made this octopus mad, and the octopus inks, it releases ink to make basically a smoke cloud in the water, and that disorients anything that's trying to attack them. But they've got to watch out. They're on the menu for almost anything with a fin. Sharks, big fish, seals, they all love cuttlefish. Their meaty bodies without spines or armor make cuttlefish a protein-rich meal. Camouflage is the cuttlefish's main defense. While they're invisible, they're safe. Once the cover is blown, their only chance is to disappear behind an inky cloud. Dolphins have developed a special taste for cuttlefish. But rather than gorging on the whole body, they prefer to just pick off their soft arms and heads. Even plants have ways to deter their predators, herbivores. Remember that an herbivore is something that only eats plant material. And so we have different adaptations. So I mentioned before that with milkweed, this plant right here, that you can see the pretty pink flowers, that they have a poison inside. And the only kind of, one or one of the few kinds of caterpillars that can eat milkweed is the monarch caterpillar. And so you see that monarch caterpillar right here. And so even though the monarch caterpillar can eat the milkweed, um, many other animals can't because of the poison. And so it is a way that it, other caterpillars don't overeat the milkweed. A pitcher plant. In Borneo's poor soil, it gets most of its nourishment from insects, lured to nectar glands under its lids. The sides of the pitcher are so waxy, few intruders escape. A watery grave awaits. At the bottom, Glands secrete enzymes that help digest the corpses and feed the plant. This fate isn't shared by all visitors. The 
red crab spider spends its entire life in the picture, hanging on with threads of silk. Instead of building a web, it lets the pitcher trap its food. The spider just waits for its meal to drown, then goes fishing. Alive, this ant would be too dangerous for the spider to tackle. The pitcher helps it snag bigger meals. The spider leaves something for its host. The digested remains of its meal will end up in the water and feed the plant. Mosquito larvae at the bottom of the pitcher seem out of reach, but they aren't. The crab spider can carry its own air supply in a bubble then it dives to the bottom of the pitcher. Once the prey is caught, the spider hauls itself back up on its silken safety line. The pitcher is a one-stop deli, but the spider is not the only diner. In a jungle, there's competition for everything, even a small pitcher plant. So that was a great example of talking about different species that live together for an extended period of time and rely on one another in a close interaction. And we call that symbiosis. And so symbiosis means living together. Now, if you live in a close interaction with something for a long period of time, it could be good and it could be bad. And so let's talk about the differences between the two. So one kind of symbiosis is called parasitism. Parasitism is where you have one organism lives in or on another organism for a lengthy period of time and they try to utilize resources from that other organism, which we call the host, without killing that organism. So we have a bunch of examples. Bacteria are an example of a parasite that we often have attack us, but they don't kill us. This is a hagfish. Um, or sorry, this is a lamprey eel. Um, these are found in fresh water and they can get onto fish. And then um, that original picture that I have of a leech. Ticks are ectoparasites on vertebrates. They pierce the skin of their host with their mouth parts and gorge themselves on the host's blood. Ticks are a concern to humans because they transmit more disease than any other arthropod. Mites tend to be much smaller than ticks. Their small size allows them to move easily among the hairs or feathers of their host. They feed on skin cells and can cause dermal irritations. The next kind of symbiosis is called mutualism, and in mutualism, Two species live in a close interaction for a lengthy period of time, but both species benefit from this relationship. And typically what they're doing is they're feeding each other, they're helping each other with their food and their other resources, and perhaps even protecting each other. This is a pretty classic example of the anemone and the clownfish. A mola mola. This oceanic wanderer stops by the mountain to be cleaned by reef fish. Butterfly fish pluck string like parasites from its flanks. The huge mola mola lives on jellyfish more than half a mile down, where the water is 20 degrees colder. This cleanup lets it warm up before another deep foray.
this Pedersen shrimp, waving its white antennae, is issuing an invitation and is accepted by a Nassau grouper. Cleaning is a striking example of symbiotic behavior. As a result of its service, the cleaner is fed, and the fish that is cleaned is healthier as a result. This nudibranch, or sea slug, feeds on an unusual prey, the toxic tentacles of the Portuguese man-o-war. Nudibranchs have evolved special metabolic processes that allow them to ingest and reuse the nematocysts of cnidarians. This sea slug's mouth is lined with mucus. It consumes the weaker stinging cells while concentrating the more venomous cells in its extremities. The sea slug can then fire the nematocysts if attacked by a predator. This coral head is a special place. It's called a cleaning station. Tiny cleaner gobies cluster near the base of the coral head. The tiger grouper often visits here. Trusting in an ancient and mysterious relationship, the gobies do not hesitate at the tiger's mouth. The gobies are allowed to crawl all over feeding on parasites and dead tissue. In return, every inch of the grouper is sanitized and groomed. In that last video, you saw the cleaner goby, and there is a mimic of the cleaner goby, which is called the saber tooth blenny. And what the saber tooth blenny does, like what you saw in that last video, it will start to do a little cleaning of a fish that comes along. And after a little bit, it will take a chunk of flesh or an eyeball and it will swim away. Pretty naughty. The last thing I wanna talk about in this lecture is the keystone species. Keystone species are one particular kind of species in a community that have a great impact on the health of that community. If a keystone species is removed from a community or they start to dwindle in number, it can have very drastic effects on the health of that ecosystem. Elephants are an example of a keystone species. There was a study done back in 1969 by an ecologist named Robert Payne, and he thought he had a really good idea that he would remove these brightly colored sea stars from the west coast of the United States. And what happened was when they were all gone and removed, the mussel population, it just exploded and the diversity of all the other organisms went significantly down. But soon thereafter, when they knew that there was a problem, they reintroduced these pizaster, brightly colored sea stars, and the ecosystem went back to being healthy. Naeem has been running experiments in the northeastern U.S., observing what happens when just one species becomes extinct. Two hundred years ago, hunters killed all the wolves in these parts, with dramatic consequences for their chief prey. People began to notice that the deer densities are, are quite high. It's estimated that they can be as high as 40 per, per square mile. So that can be up to three or four times more deer than you would expect to find in a forest like this. Naeem wants to know what effect this concentration of deer has had on the ecosystem of the forest. Today he's mapping tiny plots of vegetation to see what's growing there. Well, if you look inside this square, you'll find that there's mostly just small plants, but you won't find small baby 
oak trees. And the reason that seems to be is that we have all these deer eating all the saplings. And the reason the deer are eating all the saplings is because there are no wolves eating the deer. The difference between this part of the forest, where the deer roam, and a small fenced-in area from which he has excluded them is remarkable. Well, it's absolutely fascinating to be in this plot. I feel like we're in sort of a time machine. We're going back to a time when the density of deer were much, much lower than they are now. And this is probably what a new regenerating patch of forest would look like. You have these young trees, like this young alder tree here. You'd have many, many saplings coming up and eventually they'd sort themselves out and you'd get the forest back. And these trees are able to support a complex ecosystem of microbes, insects, and bird life all of which has disappeared with the extinction of the wolves. These things happen in every ecosystem where one important species is missing, whether it's wolves or white rhinos. The quality of our air, the quality of our water, the quality of our soil, all of that is contingent on these species doing their work for us. If we start to lose them, the ecosystem will actually change its behavior dramatically, often in very unpleasant ways, something that we might call an ecosystem collapse. And once it happens, it's almost impossible to reverse it. 